I've been stacking up the years I spent trading punches with the enemy. Built myself a double thick stone tower of lies higher than the eye can see. Trapped in my flesh and bones, crying out to you, Lord, I desperate. Love, come rattle this cage and set me free. All of my fears that Jericho cool walls gotta come. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, y'all can do way better than that. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Amy Morgan, one of the pastors here at Oak Grove, and I'm delighted to welcome you to worship both here in person and online. And I hope that you will take a few minutes to connect with Oak Grove at ogumc.org slash connect. And that's a great place if you're new to let us know who you are, to sign up for that weekly email where you get all the information, and for everyone to register your attendance and let us know of your presence. So take a moment to do that, ogumc.org slash connect. Today we have a special announcement. Um, our past senior pastor, Beth, is coming to introduce a new staff person. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. This is Elizabeth Lochran. She's our new children's director. Hooray! Yay! Elizabeth and her family have, are coming. They're going to be here. Oh, they're here now. And Elizabeth is shadowing Kim for a couple of weeks. And then she'll be full-time uh, in charge of everything on August the 1st. So I want you to welcome them. She has two teenagers, uh, Carter and Oliver. And she has a husband, Matt. So if you see her in the company of three other people, you can make the assumption that they belong together. And I hope you will take a chance to come up and speak to Elizabeth and to welcome her and her family to our congregation. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Today we continue our worship series, which is the life of the prophets, and today we're going to talk about exhaustion and the fact that exhaustion is a given. And so now I want you to join me as together we share in the call to worship. The words will be on your screen. All your works praise you, O Lord, and faithful are your servants. Bless you. They make known the glory of your kingdom and speak of your power, that the peoples may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, your dominion endless throughout all the ages. Let's stand and sing this first song together.
promised still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. It never fails. Your promise still stands.
would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for this space where we can come and sing your praises. Thank you for the chance to gather once again, to look into the eyes of those that we love, to experience your presence gathered in this place. Lord, give us rest from the week in this place, from the month, from the year. You know what a struggle it's been, and you know the struggles that lie before us. Let us trust in you enough to find rest. Let us believe in the promises you've made enough to know that you're already working in this world. That all the incredible things you've done, you will do again. And you've called us to be a part of that work. Lord, let us find this time to be a time where we're refilled, where we hear about the good things you have for us, about how you call us not only to do the work, but also to rest. We thank you that you are a God who understands the burdens of the world, but who still says, come to me and find peace, find rest, find hope for whatever it is you're carrying with you. Let me carry that load. But we know in you, we never walk alone. So Lord, prepare us, prepare us for the work you've laid out before us. Give us willing hearts to join in. And give us the faith to believe that even in our rest, you are working. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'll take a seat. This morning, our gospel lesson comes to us from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 through 34. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, in our sermon on the life of the prophets, we've spoken about how becoming a prophet often puts one in a difficult situation. Bishop Goodpastor on the 4th of July discussed how prophets are frequently unwelcome among those who know them best. Last week, I spoke about how the job of the prophet is to speak difficult truths to those in power and how that can sometimes be a life-threatening situation. Today, we see another feature of the prophet's life that we would do well to be aware of, namely, that the life of the prophet is almost always exhausting. And our example for this is the life of our Lord and Savior himself. You know, the imminent arrival of the kingdom of God was first and foremost among Jesus' subjects for teaching and preaching. His very first sermon was, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. And most of Jesus' parables are aimed at communicating what this kingdom of God is and what it is like. 
Because of this, Jesus has been called by some scholars, most notably Bart Ehrman, an apocalyptic prophet. What the heck is that, you might ask yourselves. Well, an apocalyptic prophet is one who reminds his or her hearers that God intends to transform the world in which we live at the end of time into the kingdom of God, the kingdom that God envisioned for us. This, of course, presumes that the world we're living in now is not the world that God intended for us. Change is needed in order for the world to become the kingdom of God. If you're familiar at all with the decisions of the United Methodist General Conference, you might know that our official mission statement as a denomination is this. The mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That last part, for the transformation of the world, was added in 2008. And it is, in my opinion, a critically important part of a larger statement. When we affirm that it is our job to transform the world by making disciples of Jesus Christ, we affirm that our job is to join Christ's goal of transforming the world into the kingdom of God. We can't do this single-handedly, of course. Only God can ultimately make this vision real. But we have stated that it is our job to transform the world to move it ever closer to the vision of the kingdom of God that Jesus prophesied for us. The only thing that remains for us to do once we sign on to this mission is to identify those things that need to change and to work toward that goal. Jesus obviously knew that humanity was in need of healing. We can say that with assurance because healing was a large part of his public ministry. Today's passage shows us that he spent so much time addressing the needs of the huge crowds of people who came to him for healing that he and his disciples hardly had any time to rest or even to eat. Bringing healing to the huge number of people who flocked to him from all over the countryside was no doubt an exhausting task. But Jesus did this work day in and day out because he had compassion on those who were burdened by sickness, whether that sickness was physical or mental or emotional or spiritual. The transformation of the world at the time in which he lived required freeing people from the tyranny of illness. And today, every doctor, every nurse, every medical researcher, every public health official, everyone who steps out on faith and takes part in a medical trial to test a new medicine or vaccine, everyone who works in any way in the struggle against disease is a partner with Christ in this ministry of transformation. And you have only to ask those who work in this area now how exhausting this work can be not only because of the work required to come up with treatments for diseases, treatments that work and remain effective over time, but also the often thankless work required to convince people to take those treatments. We are watching our public health system right now struggle to encourage people to take the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. That's only one of the situations of this type. One of the major struggles in my own family centered on my first cousin, Anna, who was schizophrenic. Many, ma many medicines were available to Anna through the years, and she was put on many of them from time to time, but she would inevitably decide that she no longer needed them, and she would stop taking them, and she would become sick again. So much more than just the medical situation needed to be addressed for Anna to return to herself and be well. And that situation was certainly exhausting for her and for all of us in the family. We've made great strides over time in the conquering of disease, but there are still many other ways in which our world needs to be transformed. We're learning more and more as time goes by of the devastating impact that poverty has on people's lives. Many of the missions of this church are related to eradicating poverty and its underlying causes. But as you know, if you've ever participated in one of those ministries, 
The problem of poverty is so multifaceted, it seems impossible to make any headway against it. People become poor for so many different reasons. They may immigrate to a new country because of poverty back home and then find themselves poor again when they arrive in their new country. People fall into poverty because of illness or addiction or unemployment and lack of opportunity, lack of education, lack of community or family support. There's so many disparate causes of poverty that no single mission program can hope to end it. This in itself can be exhausting, not only for those who are poor, but also for those who are hoping to end poverty for others. I remember the exhaustion of my colleagues and friends at St. Mark in Midtown who would often see the same people over and over and over again come to the church to ask for exactly the same type of assistance that they had asked for previously. No matter how many times we would help a certain person with their rent or their utility bills or with help setting a budget and keeping to the budget, they would often be back, the same people, over and over. It was spiritually exhausting to try and impact each person's unique situation. And worse, after we had helped an individual over and over again, Satan would begin to whisper in our ear, why are you helping them? They don't deserve it. They're faking it. They're fooling you. They think you're an easy target. When these voices would grow louder, we had to remind ourselves, People came back to us for help specifically because we had helped them before. If we thought poverty was exhausting for us, we needed to remind ourselves how exhausting poverty is for those who are poor. It takes mental and emotional energy to seek help. That's why people often wait to reach out for help until it's too late to impact their situation. Going back to a place where help was given before is easier in so many ways than trying someplace new where you might be rejected. Understanding that made us a little less critical of those who asked for help multiple times. When we meditate on Jesus' prophetic teachings on the need for this world to become the kingdom of God, the myriad ways that we have not created God's kingdom on earth fairly jump out of us every day. The world needs transformation in so many ways, it can be exhausting to decide where to direct our energy. If our job is to partner with Jesus to transform the world, then we need to decide, each one of us, how we will be a part of fulfilling this mission. So I ask you, what do you think is your part of this task to transform the world? What is it in this world that you feel most needs to change? What is it the greatest need of transformation that you see in the world around you? You may already be working toward correcting it in the occupation you hold or the projects that you pursue. But if you haven't thought much about how you personally can help bring about the promised kingdom of God, I challenge you to meditate on this today and to rededicate yourself to this purpose. Sometimes something as random as who you sit next to on an airplane can redirect your life's purpose. Zoe Hicks once sat on a plane beside the president of Liberia, Mrs. Ellen Johnson Shirley. As they got to know one another, Zoe asked what a church like Oak Grove could do for the people of Liberia. The president responded, we need schools. And Zoe said, okay. That began a long partnership between the United Methodist women in this place and the United Methodist women in Liberia. Together we have built one school and are currently working on building another to raise Liberian girls out of poverty and deliver them safely out of the dangerous life they live in now on the street. If you want to be a part of this, just ask so about it or any other member of our United Methodist women who are working to make this happen. Lack of education is an enormous problem, both here and overseas. But there are certainly other problems that beset us here at home. What about the unkindness and incivility that's exploding all around us? 
in the face of this problem, can we resolve to spread civility and kindness? If the problem of misunderstanding between people of different races or income levels or cultures is the issue that God has laid upon your heart, how can you seek to foster better understanding and more tolerance between people? If the problem that you long to address is injustice and unfair treatment, how will you help to foster justice and fairness in society? You might say to yourself, good Lord, no one person can do all of these things. And yet while it's true that the small actions of one person might not make much of a difference in the larger scheme of things, small actions by all people could indeed make a difference. We can get exhausted in our efforts to transform the world when we take our eyes off the small but constructive things that we're doing and focus wrongly on the enormity of the problem. Every problem can be made smaller by every small action taken. We may not be able to single-handedly end world hunger, but if there is a hungry person in front of us, we can feed them. We can do that. Becoming immobilized by how big a problem is only serves to impede progress. Every kind word, every constructive conversation, every act of compassion, every argument resolved puts some good out into the world. Every intentional move on our part to make the world a better place does indeed make the world a better place in ways we cannot begin to imagine. So I challenge you to be a part of the fulfillment of Jesus' prophetic ministry. Let us turn this world into the kingdom of God to the extent that we can do this with the help of God's spirit. Let us not become exhausted by how big the world's problems are, let us only keep our eyes on those whose needs are right in front of us. You know, Jesus once said, the kingdom of God is among you. This means that we are the fulfillment of his prophecy. We are the ones who will bring the kingdom. He has foreseen it. He has foreseen us. So let us rise from our exhaustion and continue our mission to transform the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God, we are exhausted so much of the time. Work and home tasks, demands of family and all that we have to do, care for little children, aging parents, our own health issues and struggles. We find ourselves often exhausted, and so we thank you for moments of rest, for this time to be in worship and to renew and rejuvenate ourselves. And we thank you for the call that you place on our lives to be a part of your kingdom work, transforming the world. And so today we pray that you would show each of us where we might make a difference. That you would show us where we personally can be part of your transforming work in the world. Show us now. And as we go out of worship into our daily lives, give us an openness of eyes and ears and spirit to be aware of those moments like Zoe was on the plane. Those moments when you want to give us an opportunity to smile or engage in conversation, to give someone a moment of welcome, to meet the real needs of someone who's struggling with food or housing or other needs, to be open to how you would use us 
in your kingdom work of transforming the world. And then give us the courage to respond, to not be overwhelmed by the enormity of the needs, but to take every day one step toward living in to your call to be your disciples, to transform the world. We lift this and all of our prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last week, I was at camp meeting. That's my yearly rhythm of rest. It's exhausting, but it's restful in the spirituality. I get to go to worship. I worshiped eight times last week without having to be in charge of anything. For me, that is rest. And one of the joys of the week was having my two young granddaughters. And the youngest one is two. And we were teaching them a little bit about how to do worship because they are in child care at their church on Sunday mornings. And my granddaughter, the youngest one, the two-year-old, heard the bell ringing one morning and she looked at me and said, Nani, that means it's time to go to church and give our money to God. <laughs> now she doesn't understand all the deep theology about when we give our money, it's representing giving ourselves. She doesn't understand that every time you give your gifts in the offering here to God, that you're making it possible for the church to do the transformative work of the world. But it was a seed. And so this morning, I hope that you will give your gifts to God. We look for lots of ways to make that simple for you to do. You can do it uh, online at ogunc.org slash donate. You can set up regular giving or do a one-time gift. You can set it up through your bank. That's what I do. Bill pay just sends the check every month. You can of course, do old-fashioned cash or check. There's an offering box, I know, in the portico, probably in this room. Mail a check. However you give, know that your giving is part of how you are doing the kingdom work and transforming the world. Well, your giving underwrites all of the wonderful ministries of Oak Grove, and I hope that you will take a moment this week to go to OGUMC dot org our website slash news news takes you right to that page that lists all the things that are happening and look for ways to be involved this month during the month of july we're collecting school supplies to give to montclair elementary it's a very um, low income community school that is only two and a half miles from here and we partner with that school to help them and we want to make sure every child there has the school supplies they need you can drop those off this week and next week and then next week plan to stay after church go into Grand Hall and help us sort all those supplies to get them ready for delivery. Also, another critical need that we have this week is for people 25 to 64 to help us with driving vans on Sunday morning to pick our older adults up at Kingsbridge and Claremont Place and bring them to church. The time frame works. You can be in this worship, not miss a minute of that. Can you imagine what it would be like to no longer be able to drive to church and what a blessing it is to have the bus show up and bring you? So if you're interested, you can check with me afterwards or call me at the church office. I'd love to talk with you about that. And so today, I want to invite any of you who have been thinking about officially uniting with Oak Grove, either by transferring your membership, professing your faith, to come forward if you're in person as we sing the last song, or if you're online, you can go to that ogumc.org slash connect and let us know that you're interested in learning more about joining or being baptized. And so I invite you now to stand as we sing our closing song together.
It is so great to have the band in the room. Yes. I am delighted today we have a family who is coming to unite with the church. This is the Bolson family. We've got, um, let me see if I can get all these right, Laura, Alex, Todd, and Parker. Great. And uh, they're coming by reaffirmation of faith. And so I'm going to ask them just a few questions. The first is, do you in the presence of God and this congregation renew your solemn vow and promise that was made at your baptism? We do. And do you truly and earnestly repent of your sins? We do. And do you believe in God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit? We do. 
Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament? And I'm going to ask all of you to answer this question as a way of reaffirming your commitment to Christ in the church. Do you and all of you promise, according to the grace given you, to keep God's holy will and commandments and to walk in the same all the days of your life, as faithful participants in Christ's holy church. And so I ask you, will you be faithful to Christ at Oak Grove through your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? We welcome you. We're excited to have you officially at Oak Grove. Uh, Already very involved. Laura grew up in the church, and I know after the service you'll come up and make them feel welcome. So I'll let y'all just go on back down. And if you've been thinking about officially uniting with the church, being baptized, take time. Let us know. We'd love to help you do that. Thank you for being in worship today. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for who you are, Oak Grove, as a church that cares about the community and works to transform the world. So go now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, looking for how you can be a part of God's kingdom work. Amen. Stop the storm You never caused me